Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and I'm here today with my dermatopathology fellow, Dr. Ed Fulton. And Ed has picked out uh, an interesting entity for us to discuss today, and it's called nipple adenoma. It is a lesion that arises on the nipple of middle-aged women, usually, although it can occur uh, sometimes in other age groups. And it's been known by a variety of different names. One of the, the other kind of unusual names given to it is erosive adenomatosis of the nipple, or I think florid papillomatosis of the nipple ducts, and I think there are even a couple other names, because in Dermpath, we have to name everything multiple times. I'm just kidding, but, but it's also kind of true. Um, in any case, you can tell right here from this slide, this is normal skin, by the way, that we are looking at nipple. And the way you can tell is that there are big bundles of smooth muscle, large smooth muscle bundles, uh, down here in the deep dermis. Way too many for normal skin. Way more than you would see like for the erector pili muscle. And if you need a refresher on what normal skin looks like, you can check out my normal skin histology video. I'll put a link in the upper right hand corner of this video and you can watch that if you need a refresher on skin histology. But if you see um, a bunch of smooth muscle bundles in the dermis, my mentor Jay Rowe would always say that it's one of three places. It's either the nipple, or the vulva or the scrotum. And the vulva and scrotum are uh, homologous embryologically and they have a lot of smooth muscle bundles in the dermis too. But the difference is that those smooth muscle bundles in the genital sites are very small. Many, many of them, but they're very small. And in the nipple, they're large bundles. So you can almost always look at a slide like this and say, this is nipple. If this is normal skin, this is from the nipple. All right, so that's not the lesion, but here's the lesion that we have. And I apologize, uh, I'm not gonna be able to get it to be the right way up because of how it's oriented on the slide. But we've got a very cellular proliferation that's essentially filling the dermis of this kind of uh, wedge-shaped uh, biopsy here. You can see there is some erosion or ulceration of the skin surface, and the lesion connects up to the skin surface here. It's a cellular epithelial um, uh, neoplasm, and it's connecting focally to the surface. There's also some ulceration and erosion um, here with some, some pink fibrin in the bed of the ulcer. And as we look down deeper, we can see that the, uh, that the lesion is composed of a couple of things. It's kind of, kind of busy in a lot of different patterns here. And that's one feature I think that goes along with nipple adenomas. It's got a lot of different patterns and uh, tumors that have a lot of different patterns can be sometimes challenging to sort out uh, for the pathologist. So for one thing, up here at the top, we have ductal kind of structures. They, they are ducts or tubules. This one's kind of dilated and it probably connects up to the epidermis. We just aren't cutting through the section that shows that. And there's actually a little bit of kind of squamous metaplasia right here and then that transition as we go down into more rounded kind of glandular cells that become kind of a double layer in some areas. Well, I'll show other areas later that, that show that better. And then as these ducts, uh, uh, these ductal or tubular structures go deeper, they are expanded by a proliferation of, of round oval cells that are kind of streaming and swirling together and filling up and distending the lumens of these uh, glandular or tubular structures. And uh, as we go down deeper, you can see that in some areas, the, the, uh, the structures, the, the ductal structures are totally filled with cells. And in other areas, you can see that there are still some retained uh, open lumina there. Sorry, the lighting is a little bit off today. And in these lumina, there are kind of these little uh, interconnections and infoldings of epithelium with little small ductal spaces trapped behind. So this kind of pattern reminds me of usual ductal hyperplasia of the breast. Now, before I say anything more, I'll tell you I'm a dermatopathologist and a soft tissue pathologist. I do not do breast pathology and I have not done it since I was a resident. So um, so I'm not, an, maybe not an expert at ex describing how breast pathology things look, but for this lesion, this reminds me, at least in my mind, of kind of a lot of the changes you see in usual ductal hyperplasia Plasia. And um, also some areas of this uh, nipple adenoma can uh, mimic what you see in uh, intraductal papilloma of the breast. So this is kind of how I conceptualize this lesion. And when you, uh, when you see here, I think this will be a good area to show. We'll go to high power. The, uh, the glandular spaces are lined by a kind of a double layer. In some areas though, that double layer gets very thick and, and there's a lot of ingrowth of uh, the epithelium, but you can see the outer layer here of myoepithelial cells. So the myoepithelial cells are retained, okay? You don't have loss of myoepithelial cells. The myoepithelial layer is retained. And then you have eosinophilic 
um, kind of cuboidal to columnar cells that are the inner um, apical lining of the glandular or tubular re regions. And you'll often see um, apocrine type uh, snouting uh, or decapitation on the, the surface of some of these cells. Let me see if we can find a good area that shows it. Well, now that I've said it, I won't be able to find it again. And then other areas do this. You can have infolding that really look kind of like papillae and little almost micro papillae folding in uh, to the lumen of the glandular spaces. And the, the gland lumens are, are really kind of complex and interconnected here. But again, they always have a retained myoepithelial layer and they lack severe cytologic atypia, okay? They're, the cells are kind of big, but they're relatively bland uh, here. This is a good example, I think, of the retained myoepithelial layer and then the inner lining of kind of larger columnar eosinophilic cells. So in the areas where you don't have the cellularity and the expansion uh, the, of cells filling up the ducts, uh, you, this is the, what the duct lining normally looks like. And so it's kind of <clears throat> analogous to what the normal, uh, the normal nipple ducts look like the lactiferous uh, ductules that are in the, in the nipple. So you have areas that kind of resemble um, a papilloma a little bit and other areas that kind of resemble a uh, usual ductal hyperplasia. And this lesion though is, is uh, supposed to be relatively small, usually less than one centimeter or one and a half centimeters at the biggest. It is not well circumscribed and sometimes it can give kind of the impression that it might be trickling or infiltrating at the edges. But when you see the whole lesion, it should be small and superficial, and I think <clears throat> probably down here we're getting close to the bottom of the lesion because we're transitioning back. Oh, wait, maybe it's the other piece. There's another piece on here. Now I'll never find it. Ah, here it is. <clears throat> you can see down at the bottom, we revert back to... These are the normal, I think, the normal underlying uh, nipple ducts, and you can see how the tumor is kind of connecting to those and arising up above it. So the uh, key is it should be small and superficial. Clinically, these present as crusty, painful, or um, ulcerated, eroded areas on the nipple. And so clinically, the concern might be for Paget's disease of the nipple or um, eczematous dermatitis of the nipple, nipple dermatitis. So um, a lot of times there's gonna be a lot of worry clinically that this might be <clears throat> that this might be Paget's disease. And so when you see this, the important thing is to recognize that this is a benign entity. It's relatively uncommon in my experience and uh, that it's not cancer, it's not Paget's disease of the nipple, and it's not carcinoma, okay? If you have trouble with this, getting a consult from a breast pathologist will probably help you because they're a lot more familiar with dealing with all of these cellular proliferations in the breast that are benign but look kind of funny. Um, or maybe you have more breast pathology experience than I do <clears throat> if you're a general surgical pathologist. And again, here you can see areas that are not quite as cellular, but that are made of these uh, ducts or tubules that are lined by columnar cells and that have an outer retained myoepithelial layer. And um, the one thing I think that comes up is how do you treat this or deal with this? And from my reading, um, again, I don't see these very often. And from my reading, I feel like there's not a lot, not as much clarity in the literature as I would like. And so some people say that you should excise them, um, but then other people just say that they're benign and don't make comments. And so what I what I like to think in, and to recommend is that people maybe consider getting a consultation with a breast surgeon if there's any concern that this might be a larger, deeper uh, lesion. Because what you don't want to miss is an actual like intra ductal papilloma of the deeper brass ducts that's pushing up into the nipple because there are different um, surgical uh, and management considerations that come up with um, a, a true introductal papilloma. But if this is small and localized to the nipple, I think that it's uh, the, the concept is that it should be benign and not problematic in the vast majority of cases. But I think that that's one of those things where you know doing extra surgery on the nipple is not a simple thing. It can, it can have uh, some morbidity and side effects associated with it. And so I think that it's important to, um, to get some consult from people that have expertise in dealing with this. But microscopically, these are the features you'll look for. And here's another example, beautifully showing how it connects up with the surface. And I, I, my concept is that this is overgrowth, benign overgrowth of epithelium within the ductal structures of the nipple. And so it's not surprising that just like the lactiferous ductules that communicate to the surface, that that's what you're gonna see recapitulated here in nipple adenoma. Now, it's important to bring up, there's another entity that goes by a similar name, which is kind of frustrating and maddening. It's called infiltrative syringomatous 
adenoma of the nipple, or ISAN, I-S-A-N. And that is an unrelated lesion to my knowledge, and it doesn't look like this. It shows small tubules that infiltrate way down into the skin and the underlying tissue. And um, it really, from all the things that I've read about it, it, it looks and sounds like it's basically very similar to microcystic adnexal carcinoma of the skin. It looks like, like MAC. And uh, it uh, is uh, locally aggressive, and if you don't excise it, it will um, have a high tendency for local recurrence, although to my knowledge, there's no reports of metastasis or death from it. So it's uh, locally aggressive and problematic, but I guess it's still not called a carcinoma because it doesn't actually um, cause uh, mortality as far as we know. I don't think that I've ever actually seen a real case of that, so I'm really not an expert at all to comment on it, but do know that, just remember that there are two different things in the nipple that are different and unrelated but have similar names, and then again it's confusing because nipple adenoma has like five or six different names. So. I will add um, some links down below in the video description uh, to pathology outlines and the Stanford um, Surgical Pathology uh, Criteria website that have some information about this and hopefully can help you sort it out when you're, um, when you're uh, trying to deal with this in real life. Okay, let me show you one other case here. <clears throat> now here's a case that instead of being kind of a wedge or a punch biopsy is a shave biopsy from the nipple. And you can definitely see, let's see if we can get it to go right side up. You can definitely see here multiple connections to the surface. In fact, this reminds me a lot of, uh, from low power, of um, syringocystadenoma papilliferum, or SCAP. And I've got a video on that entity. Again, I'll put a link in the upper right-hand corner of this video. You can go watch that. It usually arises on the scalp in the setting of nevus sebaceus. So this is a different clinical setting, but it reminds me because you have multiple lumens opening up to the surface and that are kind of dilated up top. And as you go deeper, those lumens get more compressed and small. Um, so the surface changes here, though, are important to, to point out because nipple adenomas can have keratin-filled cystic areas like this. They can have um, so, some of the ducts, uh, particularly the dilated superficial areas in the cystic, with cystic change, can have partial lining of squamous epithelium um, as it kind of merges with the overlying, um, overlying uh, skin surface. So it's either squamous metaplasia or just involvement by the, the uh, kind of transition from the, the um, stratified squamous of the skin down into the ductal lining of the tumor. And then here you have, or I don't know if tumor is the right word, but of the of the lesion, let's say. And here you have kind of a, com, uh, a kind of a squamous uh, metaplasia look up in the upper right. But then it transitions into little papillary infoldings. There's lots of keratin debris in the lumen. And then down here, you can see that you've got a real compressed double layer of maybe cuboidal cells um, that are that are present. You can also see here that there are little little tufts and micro papillae, kind of similar to some of the areas I showed in the previous case. Now, the thing that I think gets a little problematic is down here. Down here, you just have compressed little tubules and ductules that are kind of uniform and small, and it's hard to tell if they're infiltrative or not because you they're completely transected here at the base of the biopsy. So this is one of those settings where, honestly, it, looking at this, it makes me a little nervous to not be able to see the base. And the, the, the bottom portion of this lesion kind of reminds me of what I've seen pictures of or descriptions of, of infiltrating syringomatous adenoma of the nipple, uh, these small kind of uniform tubules that look like they might be infiltrative. My experience with sweat gland neoplasms is that in the midst of um, some sweat gland lesions and other adnexal lesions, you can get really busy areas that look like they might be infiltrative, but once you see the entire lesion and see the edge, it becomes more clear that maybe there's not true infiltration. So when you have a partial sample of a lesion with ductal differentiation in the skin, um, it's important to not overinterpret something as infiltrative and, and malignant if you're not totally sure, because it can be really challenging to tell on a partial sample. So the one thing I think that makes me feel a little better about this not being infiltrating, uh, infiltrative syringomatous adenoma is the fact that in the surface we have areas like this with the dilated cystic spaces with a kind of papillary tufts and infoldings of cells. We have some focal areas that kind of resemble usual ductal hyperplasia, I think, in the, in the other piece of tissue here. And those features are supposed to go along with regular nipple adenoma and not with infiltrating syringomatous adenoma of the nipple, at least, again, by my reading. I'm not an experienced, uh, an expert on that, that second entity because I have no experience with it personally in real life yet. So anyway, I think that this probably is a nipple adenoma. 
Um, and then again, whether or not to do an excision to see the base of this, I think that's a careful discussion that has to be had between the patient and the treating physicians and the pathologist to discuss what the, the risks and benefits are of doing that. And I think that's true of any time you're going to talk about doing um, a potentially problematic surgical excision on a, uh, a lesion that's not definitively malignant or that you think might be benign but you're not sure. It's always really important to have discussions carefully of risks and benefits. And, it's imp and I often will put that in my consult reports, especially about unusual um, entities, that, to remind people that, that it is important to have the patient be involved in this conversation and to, to talk with the surgeon or the dermatologist about what the risks are and what the benefits are, and then to make an informed decision about their uh, care. And I think that's just good medical practice. So, so you have to treat things on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I think that that's probably the best way for us to, to approach things. And having pathologists be involved in that discussion uh, with the treating physicians is um, a way that we can add value for our medical colleagues and for our patients. So I hope you like this video about nipple adenoma. Uh, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet and click the, the thumbs up button down below if you like the video. And also add comments or questions that you might have in the comment section, uh, particularly if you have experience with, uh, with nipple adenoma or infiltrative syringomatous adenoma uh, of the nipple. I'd love to hear from you and hear your thoughts and opinions about this entity as well. Thanks so much for watching.